morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's so good to be here and to have the sun shining. And I am uh, traveling to Manitoba in about five hours, so I'm very excited to see that sun shining. I'm uh, doing a course at the San Ysidro Center this week, uh, which came up early Sunday, so um, I look forward to talking about it when I get back. Uh, a couple other announcements this week. We'll be at uh, Rockwood next Sunday at 10 o'clock as usual. Uh, and don't forget to stay for the zucchini layout today. There's lots of uh, delicious looking muffins back there. Uh, I was not surprised about who won, but <laughs> it's always good to mention them anyway. The rest of us can just keep trying to be more in this competition. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's great to see some zucchinis back there, and I'm sure that they will be turned into some wonderful things. Um, and we look, hope your pumpkins are growing well, and if not, uh, keep my own lemons. So we can't let Mary win everything this week. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other announcements people would like to share this morning? Uh, just a, a heads up this uh, week on the 19th, I believe it is is a super blue full moon. And that's because it's the closest, and the moon is in its closest orbit to Earth, and it's not a blue moon that's twice in a month. It's in the seasonal, uh, <laughs> astrological season. And you might wonder why I'm telling you this. Because uh, for the creation pack in uh, September, um, the, the sun, the, the one I'm looking after uh, the scriptures based on the sun and the moon and the stars. And so I've been trying to pay attention to things astrological. <laughs> <laughs> and there's actually four super moons in a row, August, September, October, November, this fall. So I just wanted to draw your attention to this first one. Hopefully it's a um, clear night. And uh, get your binoculars up, you'll be able to see things. And uh, uh, stay tuned for whatever I come up with. Super blue and a harvest is going to be, well, something's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a uh, message from Randy Dewey. <laughs> I counted the tomatoes, I lost count, three degrees. I, I think it's uh, two baker's dozens. <laughs> wow. 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 Tomatoes. And then I have something else here today, and I'm going to cheat on it. And if anybody figures out what the cheat is, I'm in the record book. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> we can collect enough tomatoes at the end of the summer to do a tomato soup fundraiser and to share the wealth of our gardens. Any other announcements to share? Uh, we do have still two spots for writing in the creation packs. If you wanted to write a reflection for contemplation and conversation, uh, send me an email. I'd be happy to and you have to write one or two or none of two. Um, so if you're interested, uh, that, we're opening that up to anybody. We were hoping to have couple people from Rockwood writing, but uh, we'll take anybody at this point, so just send me some emails. Any uh, good news this morning? The things you're excited for, things you're anxious about, that you want to know about? Yeah, I have back my fishing trip and it was awesome. Caught some really great fish. Was able to supply fish for the fish fry on the Friday for the whole lodge. Cool. So, um, yeah, I had a good week away. Wonderful. <laughs> There's nothing better than fresh fried fish. Um, yeah. 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 It's probably the 90s, but Emily's on Thursday for her four months in Ireland. So we're all ready, packing and getting ready to go. Mm -hmm. Very much enjoy. I both love hearing about all our adventures, trying to get everything ready to go. And we can her while she's away for sure. And a saga. <laughs> Oh, most of you know this because I put it on, a, on an email, but I just wanted to pass it on that Paul May had called me on Friday, the day that he moved to the Wellington Terrace. And he was very happy and seemed to be glad that he was there. So that was kind of a um, turnaround from, from other thoughts that had come through to us. So I was really happy to hear that he was feeling good. But, Any birthdays we should be celebrating this morning? No one's admitting to a birthday? <laughs> Let's light our candle for the good news we've shared, the good news in our hearts, and the good news that wherever we go, God is there with us. 
let's uh, center ourselves in this kind of worship with our gathering music. Gracious 
God, hear our silent prayers as we confess those things that separate us from you and from each other.
with the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. So I invite you to listen to the words of Matthew 1, 21 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the nearest for the day, he sent them to his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw the others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And when he went out again about noon, and then about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found the others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to him, Then, You also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his managers, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired at about five o'clock came, they each received a denarius. Now when they first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for, for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to you this last, the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. Let us pray. Bless this reading to our understanding and our faithful living. Now may the words of my mouth, the thoughts of our minds, and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. What would it be like to be one of those laborers who wait outside the vineyard each day, hoping to have enough work for their families so that they can feed them for just one more day? For the people chosen first, I'm sure that there are feelings of contentment and gratitude that they were able to get a whole day's work and not have to worry about where their next meal was coming from. When they started working, I'm sure they would want to work hard to show that they were committed to the work so that they would hopefully get chosen again the next day. But as the day wore on and the sun rose higher in the sky, beating down on them, they would be getting hot and tired, wanting to take a break but also trying to push through to show their commitment to the job. They might even begin to feel a little jealous of the people sitting in the shade, waiting for work. But there really isn't much to be jealous of when you think about those people who are waiting in the shade. They're not just sitting there relaxing, enjoying their day. They're worrying about how they're going to feed their family, trying to think of ways to stand out from the crowd so that they would be chosen and desperately hoping that someone will come along with more work, knowing that it wouldn't be enough to feed them for the whole day, but thinking that it would be better than getting nothing at all. They would be coming in rested while the previous workers were beginning to get tired, and they would know that they wouldn't be working as long as the others, so maybe they would be working harder, working faster, to prove that it was good to hire them, and hopefully get noticed for the next day's work. The workers hired at the end of the day were probably feeling desperate and dejected by the time that they got, finally got chosen. They would want to work to support their families and to contribute to the community, but there just wasn't enough work to go around for the day, so they would be sitting there all day fretting about where their next meal is going to come from, feeling like they failed, when in reality it's the system that has failed them. When they finally get a chance to do some work and earn a little money, I wonder if they approach the work with the energy and enthusiasm of someone who was starting fresh for the day, or whether they were so weighed down by the emotional burden of the day that they were picking at the same speed of those tired from working all day. Imagine the joy they must have felt 
when they found out that they were being paid a whole day's wages and that they could set aside all of that worry that they felt for the day. I'm sure the workers in the midday group felt a little put out that they had to work longer and yet receive the same pay. But I imagine the relief of getting a full day's wages for a half day work would outweigh any frustration. It is of course not surprising that the workers who started in the morning would be angry. They worked hard for their wages. They were hot, they were tired, they were sore from a long day's work. They probably had scratches from being working in the vines all day. They would definitely be overheated from the hot sun. You could see why they felt like they earned a higher wage and why it would seem unjust to them to receive the same as everyone else. But what they weren't seeing was the injustice in the system that they were working in. Everyone came in the morning willing and ready to work. They all wanted to contribute their labor, but yet only a few were chosen. When the vineyard hates them equally, they are not favoring one person over another. They're correcting an injustice in the system that would have allowed some people to go hungry while others had enough to get by. It is natural to feel cheated when something seems unfair, but we have to be able to look beyond our own wants and needs to see the whole picture to really determine what is fair. As I was reading this story, I was reminded of one of my favorite um, book series, The Little Critter Books. Um, this was pretty popular when I was growing up in the 90s, uh, so some of you may be familiar. Um, and th this is what probably was one of my favorite books as a kid because I was really concerned about what was fair. My grandparents always um, gave me and my sisters presents on each other's birthdays, a little bit smaller because it wasn't our birthdays, but it would only be fair if we all got presents. And there was a very strict schedule about who got to sit in the front on which days that was only interrupted by our birthdays. They worked very hard to keep our life fair, and I liked things to be ordered and fair as a child. Um, and I was thinking that we read books to nephews and grandchildren and children, but it's probably been a really long time since someone's read a book to you. So I'm going to read That's Not Fair by Mercer Mayor this morning. And as you're, uh, if you're not familiar with this book, there are little um, animals on each page. So in this book, it's a mouse. You can see the little mouse down by the um, drums set in the corner. So as we're going through, uh, you can look on each page and see if you can find the little mice throughout the story, which was also good for my little girl every spring that needed something else to look at while I was focusing on the story. Some things just aren't fair. I had to make my bed. That wasn't fair. I was just going to get, it was just going to get messed up again. I wanted to give my haircut, sister a haircut, but mom said, no, you can't. That wasn't fair. So I gave my sister's doll a haircut instead. <laughs> I wanted to eat watermelon in the living room, but mom made me go in, back into the kitchen. That wasn't fair. We went to the mall to get some new clothes. I didn't want new clothes. I wanted to go to the toy store, but mom said, not now. I had to put on a pair of pants and a sweater. I wanted to get an ice cream cone, but mom said we didn't have time. So I asked to go to the candy store instead, and we couldn't do that either. I didn't do, get to do anything I wanted to do. It just wasn't fair. On the way home, I turned on my ray gun, and dad made me stop because the baby was sleeping. That's not fair, I said. Dad said, things aren't always fair. Later, I made a tent out of mom's bedspread, and mom said, you have a tent outside. I said, I don't want to play outside. I had to go anyway. Was that fair? Mm -hmm. I found a skunk in the garden. <laughs> I wanted to bring him into the house and feed him. Look how cute he is. <laughs> but mom and dad screamed, no! That wasn't fair. The skunk was really hungry. I wanted to take my brother for a bike ride. But mom said he was too little. He wanted to go. It wasn't fair. Later, Dad made me give the dog a bath. It wasn't fair. My dog likes to be dirty. 
At dinner, I ate all my carrots, but I had to take out the trash anyway. I knew that wasn't fair. Then I had to take a bath. That wasn't fair. I like to be dirty too. When I wanted to finger paint, Dad said, not now, you've just had a bath. I got mad. I yelled, that's not fair. Dad made me go to my room until I said I was sorry. I said I was sorry, even though it wasn't fair. I just wanted to watch TV. Mm -hmm. Mom and Dad say that sometimes things just aren't fair. But there is one thing that I know is fair. I get to stay up later than my sister and brother every single night. <laughs> When you look at the story from a child's perspective, you can see why some of those things seem fair and not fair. The making the bed thing, that really stuck with me. I don't make my bed because it doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> so when you're a child, you don't get to decide all of those things for yourself, and life seems really unfair. But if you actually look at the needs of each person in those dynamics, uh, it's probably only the very last page where he's actually correct in what's fair and what's not. I don't think he really understands why, though, um, because uh, for him to stay up later than his siblings, it makes sense because they're little and they need more sleep. So it is fair because it's taking everyone's needs into account. But in all of those other situations, the little critter was only looking at the world from his perspective and only taking into account his own needs. A few months ago, I was talking with someone about the ways that we're working on reconciliation with Indigenous people, and they expressed that they felt it was unfair that Indigenous people were given so many advantages with programs and scholarships and lots of things that are earmarked only for Indigenous people. They felt that there are many people living in this country with poverty, so it was unfair that only a few got extra support. And they're not wrong that there are many people in our country living in poverty. But it is a false equivalence to compare that to the fact, to the way that we are trying to support Indigenous people to um, reconcile for wrongs that have been done to them in the past. I could have just told this person that they were wrong and explained the reasons why I felt that way. But in order to really help them to understand why it is fair to support a group of people who have been oppressed, I have to take the time to understand why they feel it's unfair. This person came to Canada as a young adult from Scotland. Like the indigenous people in Canada, the people of Scotland were colonized, and they were not allowed to show that they were part of any tribal system. They were punished for wearing the tartans of their clan that they had worn for generations. And there was similar impacts of discrimination, loss of culture, and poverty in those communities. If I truly want to help this person understand why the steps we are taking towards reconciliation in Canada are so important. I must first acknowledge the hurt and complex feelings of being assimilated into the culture of the colonizers that this person must be experiencing. It is easier to ignore the impacts of colonization in countries where the people look racially similar because they don't have to face the fact that the race, they don't have to face the racism that indigenous people in Canada face every day. Despite their experience of a similar loss of culture and identity, people who were colonized in Western Europe have more advantages in their modern world due to their white privilege. White privilege is a term that has become popular in conversations around justice to explain how some people have advantages because of solely based on their race. Some people have rebelled against this term because while they are white, they may not have all of the same advantages of the people around them. It's hard to understand privilege when you don't have enough money to put food on the table or don't have a safe place to live. The reality is that while white privilege does exist, for example, I've never had to fear for my safety because of my race, there are many other factors that impact privilege because I have had to fear for my safety as a woman walking alone at night. A few um, years ago, I came across this image that I think is one of the best ones I've seen to explain how privilege works. There are many different kinds of privilege that we can have, uh, and probably several more that are highlighted on this simple image. Um, but it talks about white privilege, gender privilege, um, 
able-bodied privilege, mental health privilege, religious privilege. We have a lot of religious privilege as Christians because the country was based on our Christian calendar. And each person carries some of these balloons or a lot of these balloons, and it just lifts you up and it makes things a little bit easier. And the more of them you have, the more advantages you have. We need to carry all of these intersectionalities into any conversations about equity and justice so that we don't leave people behind in the conversations. If we don't acknowledge that people are all the way down the hill because they're struggling with their disability and their gender and their sexual identity, and therefore they feel like they're on the same level as people who are experiencing racism and other forms of discrimination, we're going to end up leaving people behind and losing them in the conversation. When having these big conversations, it's important to understand the lived experience of each person at the table and try to meet them where they're at. Although it is not the job of the oppressed to comfort the privileged, we can all work together to listen to one another's experiences and help each other see the big picture. The laborer who is working hard all day, who is hot and tired and sore from a long day's work, may not recognize the privilege of having the peace of mind of job security for the day. But if someone takes the time to acknowledge how they're feeling and explain to them the importance of making sure that everyone has their needs met for the day, I trust that they would understand why everyone getting the same wages was in fact the fair thing to do. I pray that the scripture will help us to open, be open to our own biases that we need to let go of to create more a more equitable world and give us the courage to speak out when we are being treated unfairly ourselves. This parable reminds us that no one is outside of the comfort and protection of God's love and invites us to look for ways that we can care for one another so that all people may know that love. May it be so. Amen. So for our conversation this morning, I'll invite you to turn to a neighbor or to reflect inwardly on your own, to think about how do you stay open to the diverse needs of people around you, including remembering to acknowledge your own needs.
Let's um, stand if you feel comfortable and lift our voices and enjoy a song as we sing together and worship the Lord.
Whether you were the first who came to God joyfully and young in your youth, or the last who is really developing your faith later in life, God loves you and treats us all just the same. Go now in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this day and always. Amen. Thank you.